welcome to the Participatory Medicine Learn Exchange, where our webinar series continues. I'm Sarah Krug, the Acting Executive Director of the Society for Participatory Medicine, uh, the CEO of Cancer 101, and founder of the Health Collaboratory. And today I have the privilege of calling in from Singapore, where it's one in the morning. Uh, but not a problem, I have a double espresso in hand, and uh, I'm in good shape and excited to learn from our thought leaders today. So today we have a interesting topic, digital health management, hype versus reality, uh, where we have a power panel of speakers. And it's an honor to introduce our moderators today, Janice McCullum and Vera Rulan. Janice McCullum recently joined the board of the Society for Participatory Medicine. She's also the founder of Health Content Advisors, a consulting practice that advises medical publishers and producers of health data on various strategies. Uh, she's also on the Board of Trustees uh, of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And Vera Rulan is president and founder of TIR Health Advisors and chair of the Society for Participatory Medicine Policy Committee. Uh, Vera is also on the Executive Council for the Center for Healthcare Innovation and senior strategic advisor for the Personal Connected Health uh, Alliance. So before we begin, I'd like to discuss the history behind the Learning Exchange. Uh, for those new to SPM, participatory medicine is a movement in which network patients shift from being mere passengers to responsible drivers of their health, and in which healthcare professionals encourage and value them as full partners. SPM's mission is simple. It's to catalyze collaborative partnerships across the continuum of care to optimize health. And the Society's foundation is based upon four pillars, which include community building, advocacy and policy, research and education, which ironically spell care, and we didn't do that on purpose. To learn more, I encourage you to visit our website. Now the Learning Exchange was created to help you showcase your work. Understanding the work we're conducting in our individual silos can help us learn from one another, allow us to build upon ideas, forge collaborations, provide a forum for feedback and suggestions, and hopefully avoid duplication of efforts. The Learning Exchange allows us to also capture how we're collecting, collectively moving this participatory medicine needle, whether it's through our day-to-day -day personal experiences with healthcare or our work in this area. Many thanks to our sponsors, Accenture and Vocera. Vocera, who is also graciously hosting our technicals through WebEx, uh, offers a leading platform for clinical communication, and their mission is to simplify and improve the lives of healthcare professionals and patients while enabling hospitals to enhance quality of care and operational efficiency. Accenture is a Fortune Global uh, 500 company, a uh, global management consulting firm that provides strategy, technology, and operations services in over 120 countries. Now feel free to type in your questions in the chat box uh, on your panel and uh, we'll get to the Q&A at the very end. And now I will turn it over to our moderators, Janice and Vera. Thank you, Sarah. This is uh, Janice McCallum. As Sarah said, I'm a member of the board of SPM. Uh, the short bio she gave only touches the surface of my background. So if you want any more details or connect with me on LinkedIn, just just look me up on LinkedIn. Um, well, I want to welcome all of our attendees listening real time and to those who will be listening to the recording. Today's theme of digital health management, hype versus reality, was chosen because it reflects the, the disconnect most of us feel when we hear about new technologies that will revolutionize healthcare, but don't necessarily see how most of the new devices and apps will help individual patients who we know uh, with their personal health goals. Today we're fortunate to have three outstanding uh, speakers. I'm gonna move, move on here. Um, whose expertise in digital health technology runs a spectrum from an expert in healthcare provider strategy, a pioneer in government incentive programs for consumers, and a founder of a nonprofit consumer health advocacy organization. More details to follow. Uh, my role today is to introduce the speakers. Vera will jump in to moderate the Q&A session after the presentations. I think Sarah said uh, use the chat window, but there's actually a Q&A window as well. Uh, we'll, we'll, moder we'll look at both of them, so 
wherever you want to type your question. Um, before I introduce the speakers, uh, let me just describe the plan for the rest of the hour. We'll have presentations from each of the speakers, then we're leaving, uh, we hope, about 15 minutes at the end for questions, so please post them at any time. Finally, please note the hashtag SPM Learning for this webinar series and all the, the Twitter handles for all the speakers, moderators, and, and our host are included if you want to tweet out during the, the webinar. Uh, moving along, I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker. As Vice President Connected Health at Partners Healthcare in Boston, Dr. Joe Kvidar is creating a new model of healthcare delivery, developing innovative strategies to move care from the hospital or doctor's office into the day-to-day -day lives of patients. He's the author of The New Mobile Age, How Technology Will Extend the Lifespan and Optimize the Health Span, which was published in 2017, and The Internet of Healthy Things, published in 2015. He's also a professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School. Uh, uh, under Dr. Kvidar's direction, Partners Connected Health has launched innovative mobile health programs, virtual care initiatives, and clinical research programs at Partners Healthcare affiliated hospitals, including Brigham and Women's and Mass General. He's the program chair for the Connected Health Conference. Sorry, I'm hearing some background noise. Can somebody mute? Um, where was I? He's the program chair for the Connected Healthcare Conference, an industry-defining event co-hosted by Partners Connected Health and the HIMSS Personal Connected Health Alliance. He currently serves on the editorial board of NPJ Digital Medicine, a nature research journal. Uh, the popular C Health blog provides his insights and vision for Connected Health. He's also a strategic advisor to uh, Flare Capital Partners, Wave Edge Capital, Pure Tech Ventures, and Qualcomm Life, and a member of the board of Be Well Connected Health. Um, there's a couple more things, but um, I don't know if we have time to include them all, so I think I'll end there. But um, before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Kvita, uh, I'd like to introduce the other speakers, then we'll uh, launch directly into his presentation. After Dr. Kvidar, uh, Lijaya Ricciardi will present her perspective on hype versus reality in, in digital health. Lijaya has been at the vanguard of consumer engagement in digital health for over a decade. After developing case studies for Harvard Business School and serving as a director of the Markle Foundation's health program, she joined the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, or as we call it, ONC. At ONC, Lijaya established and led the consumer program, putting consumers' and patients' concerns on the map through policies and public-private partnerships, such as the Meaningful Use and Incentive Program and the Blue Button Initiative. Lijaya currently advises companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500s on how to develop and implement digital tools and strategies that support individuals' participation in their own health and healthcare. Following Lijaya, we have Donna Cryer, who is a patient, patient advocate, and attorney who founded and leads the Global Liver Institute. She's a frequent speaker on topics of patient engagement in research and healthcare de delivery redesign and serves on several boards, including the People-Centered Research Foundation and Sibley Memorial Hospital in Washington, D.C. I want to give a warm welcome to all of our speakers. As someone commented on Twitter, we have a panel of rock stars today. Uh, doc, doc, sorry, I'm hearing background noise again. Um, Dr. Kvita, I, I'll hand control over to you now. Well, thanks so much, Janice. It's really a pleasure for me to be a part of this uh, event today. I've been a, a supporter, fan, member of the society uh, since its inception, so it's a it's a real pleasure to be part of this and to talk about hype versus hope. I feel like I spend most of my time uh, talking about that. At, at, with with 25 years of experience in the space, I have to remind myself not to be too hopeless uh, sometimes because there is so much hype. But what I decided I would focus on today is this one small area, which I think influences much of our hype versus hope problem, and that is how we communicate 
particularly about behavior change. And one of the things that I've learned in my uh, time in, in the area of connected health is how much of the end result of using these technologies, particularly in the care of chronic illness, is the, the getting the ball over the goal line, if you will, uh, is all about behavior change. And in my opinion, and I'm going to lay out my case for you momentarily, we don't quite have that figured out, and that leads to a lot of people having solutions that in the beginning they, they seem to be shiny new toys and then they die quickly because they haven't really figured this out. So I'm going to share what I believe the quandaries and, and dilemmas are in this, and, and there, are, there are several. Then I want to talk a little bit about a framework that we developed uh, in my first book, The Internet of Healthy Things, for understanding uh, how to design for behavior change. And then just a couple of examples, because I know time is short for that. So that's, uh, that's my agenda, and uh, let's go right into it. So I think we could all agree with this. I hope everyone on, on the phone uh, and on the line is is uh, an agreement that we all want to live a long, healthy life. Quite candidly, if you don't believe this, in our society, we, we offer you mental health counseling. This is, that's how much of a given that statement is. Um, the, the challenge with it, though, is really that we, do, we want to do this on our own terms, and, and we, do, we want to do it without accountability for short-term decisions. So many of the decisions we make on a short-term basis influence lifespan and health 10, 15 years down the line, and our brains just simply aren't wired to process that information and, and make those decisions. And I'm sure many of you are students of, of behavioral economics. There's a lot that's been written on this challenge. So that's the first thing I want to say is the paradox is we, we want to live a long and healthy life but we have all these little things that get in the way. And so our response to that has really been two things. One is a traditional marketing approach, and the other is the medical model. And they seem to be quite different. Neither one of them, in my opinion, is working all that well. The traditional marketing approach is designed these days in a digital mobile world to inspire an impulse purchase. You see something come up in your uh, Instagram feed or as a, a banner ad on a website or wherever you might be scrolling through content, and it's interesting to you, you click on it, and you're in this world where you're being grabbed into doing something. That's a behavior change, but it's a really specific kind of behavior change, and it's to do something that sort of fires some dopamine receptors in your brain and feels good at the moment. Uh, healthcare on the other hand, is a different kettle of fish because all these things listed on, these on this slide kind of get in the way of having health behaviors be top of mind. Uh, they're, they're not sexy. Most of the time we're talking to people about an illness, about reminding them that there's something wrong with them. Nobody really likes to be reminded of that. Life tends to get in the way. You have this discussion with your doctor and leave the office really, really pumped to go out and be healthy, and then 15 things between the time you get in the car and get home are in the way, taking care of family, doing other things, work-related projects, and there you have it. I mentioned the short-term decisions with long-term benefits. That is an enormous challenge for us, the way our brains are wired. We simply are look very carefully at those short-term decisions. And, and view them in that context and just can't get that abstract long-term benefit. Uh, discipline is a big part of it. It's just much easier to, to uh, go off the wagon. We, we all know this. And the same impulsive behavior that's sought after in retail is often detrimental. So in a way, the retail marketing is exactly the opposite of what we need. And finally, denial is a powerful thing. So we have all these things that kind of get in the way of us uh, choosing the right path. And, and, of course, there are others as well that uh, help, help us uh, not make the right choice. Now, on the other hand, the medical model is overly clinical. And I grew up, uh, uh, I'm trained as a physician. I still see patients. 
And I'm always struck by patients who come to me, and those of you who know me know I'm a, a fairly mild-mannered fellow, and people come to me and say, I'm a dermatologist, they say, don't yell at me because I have a sunburn. I haven't yelled at anyone in 30 years. But the medical model is about cajoling you or trying to frighten you into behavior change. And we have to realize that it's not about education. Educating you simply that you're doing something that's not good for you falls on deaf ears. It's more about inspiration, and we're not really good at that at all. So the medical model is really about frightening you. It's about uh, uh, trying to convince you that if you, if you don't do something, um, you'll get sick. It just doesn't resonate. I don't know if it ever did, but it certainly doesn't resonate in the early 21st century. And I think this uh, factoid here just really compounds the challenge that most of the things that we're talking about don't give you symptoms. And I'm talking about uh, high blood pressure, uh, uh, borderline diabetes, high cholesterol, all of those silent killers that you can affect on a daily basis with lifestyle changes, but you get no feedback loop. And so you're out there saying, well, I guess I'll have the cheese kick. I don't feel any different, when in, in fact that's, that's having a negative effect on your long-term health. And then the last thing, which is not mentioned on the slide, but I'll throw it in just because it makes it seem almost hopeless, is that we're surrounded by opportunities to make unhealthy choices, whether it be in the foods we eat or whether it be uh, all the elevators and escalators and all the non-taking the stairs or parking our car close to the uh, uh, destination or, or, or getting a ride in a golf cart when you're, when you're at some place. All of that stuff is designed to be unhealthy and it's just surrounding us. So we have an enormous challenge in this healthy behavior change uh, problem. Now, I got inspired to really think hard about how to change this. Uh, about five years ago, when, when we were starting to put together the framework for, for the Internet of Healthy Things, and I, this, this stat is, of course, old news to all of you by now, but when I first heard it, I was riding home, and it was some story on NPR, and it really struck me that we have these devices that are so addictive that we can't put them down. We keep checking them. It's fear of missing out. There's a little bit of, again, dopamine in the brain that gets fired. And I was thinking about it in the context of something we were doing at the time, which was remote blood pressure monitoring. And we had these two uh, hub devices in the field. Now, the way these programs work is you, nowadays you use a, a Bluetooth uh, cuff, but in, in those days we, we had a mixed environment. So on the left there's this device where you would plug your blood pressure cuff into the plug you see there and push the blue button and that would upload your data to uh, the cloud where we could capture it and share it with your clinician. And on the right is a wireless device, really a, a predecessor to uh, Qualcomm's TuneNet Hub actually. And, and uh, that one automatically connected. So what, what you did was take your blood pressure and wirelessly it magically wound up in the cloud. And when we were, because we had these two in the field at the same time, we decided to look at their utilization and we found that the people who had to push the button uploaded their data three times less frequently than the people who didn't. And so I was puzzled by the fact that we somehow managed to make your smartphone so addictive you check it 100 times a day, but we've somehow made taking care of your blood pressure so either boring or frightening that I can't get you to push a button once a day to upload your data. And for me, that was really a turning point because that led to one of the pivotal chapters in this book, The Internet of Healthy Things. And it's on that note that I want to share both the framework we developed and, again, a couple of examples of how this works. So the, the big picture framework from The Internet of Healthy Things it's about collecting all kinds of specific data about you, so-called digital exhaust or digital dust that you leave behind every day, whether it's your GPS data, your mobile purchasing data, your frequency of how outbound messaging, maybe it's something from your Apple uh, Watch, uh, et cetera, your Fitbit, all of these data, and then applying an analytics framework to them so that we can develop a unique 
uh, persona of you and you alone, and then applying an engagement philosophy. And I, again, because of shortage of time, I'm only going to talk about the engagement piece today. But the first two pieces are important, and they're covered in detail uh, in the book. And this is the three strategies and three tactics that we talk about uh, for keys to engagement. This is our framework. Uh, I'm sure there are others that are equally compelling, but it's really helped to me. So very uh, succinctly, because again, I only have time for a few examples, make it about life. That's this notion that health has to fit into your life. It can't be this uh, uh, thing that goes on in parallel. We as, as individuals that are helping you shepherd you into a healthier life have to be able to get our messaging fit into the context of your life. Uh, a quick example of that is if, if you uh, want to lose some weight, may maybe it's to uh, fit into an outfit and go to a special event, uh, as opposed to me saying, if you don't lose five pounds, you're going to have a heart attack in 10 years. That's make it about life. Make it personal. I have an example of that one that I'm going to share, but that's this, it, the, the more personal these messaging uh, scenarios get, the more uptake people uh, uh, display. Reinforce social connections. I think every mobile uh, uh, interaction these days has a social component, and that's no different in enc encouraging healthy behavior. Now, the tactics, uh, subliminal messaging, I have a little story on that one. Unpredictable rewards is simply that, which is when you uh, open uh, uh, whether that, that's really why we keep going back to our phones, because we want to make sure that, that there's nothing there that we miss. So it's, it's the other side of fear of missing out. And then sentinel effect, which is very much related to behavioral, uh, sorry, to social in the sense that it's about this notion that uh, we behave differently when we know we're being watched, especially by someone that we respect. And so as healthcare providers, we try to use the sentinel effect in a lot of the work that we do. All right, so again, I'm going to go through this now lickety split so we have time for our other uh, presenters. But the three uh, engagement strategies, again, you see pictured here. And I'm going to focus on a project called Feet Forward because it illustrates personalization. This started out as a question we had about type 2 diabetes. And we wanted to ask the question if we could compel or inspire people with type 2 diabetes to be more active. But we, we put a, 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 a catch, which was we wanted to do it without human intervention. So we wanted to develop an automated system that would result in people being more active. And we took in four kinds of data, including their, their wearables, an activity tracker, some data about their uh, level of interest in being more active, weather, uh, and some uh, very simple um, location data, and we would send them once a day a personalized contextual message that was relevant to all four of those variables, encouraging more activity. And sure enough, after a six-month program of people getting those messages, not only were they more active, but their diabetes got better uh, with the same or uh, a cohort effect as a uh, oral anti-diabetic drug. So this was, in our minds, the beginning of the concept of digital therapeutics, and it was all about personalization. Make it social is another fun story. I, I just have to tell this one because, again, we fell into it, but we were lamenting with some of our colleagues in pediatrics how they want uh, 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 teenagers, particularly with asthma, to fill out a tool called the asthma control test because it gives them a sense of impending bad outcomes. People who score low on the ACT are people you want to watch more closely and, and uh, try to help them avoid an ER visit or a, 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 some, some, an admission to the hospital. So we were lamenting that, as you can see here, 18%, 18% of the time when you present teenagers with this uh, form in the waiting room, that's, that's the number of times they, they fill it out. It's dismal. So we did something very simple. We, we put it on a Facebook group. We, we created a private Facebook group for these uh, teenagers with asthma. And lo and behold, their engagement with the survey went up to 79%. That was our goal. But the uh, unexpected consequence was that they, they actually did better with their asthma control. 
uh, by a point, 1.47 point difference simply by being in this Facebook group, no other intervention. And that told us just how powerful social can be. Again, another example of a digital therapeutic. And on the three tactics, I only really have time to share with you a story around subliminal messaging. Again, another one I love because this one, by the way, also I think is an illustration of make it about life. They're, they're very similarly connected in this story. So the reason you see a feature phone here is because we did these experiments before the advent of the smartphone, and that's an important part of the story. And one of the dermatology residents came to me one day, this is at least 15 years ago, and said, hey, I have an idea. If we sent uh, people a text message, do you think they would use sunscreen more frequently? Uh, and I said, I don't know, beats me. Let's, let's give it a try. So we set this experiment up where everyone got a tube of sunscreen with a measurement device on it. So we knew when they were actually opening the tube. And half of them got a daily, in the morning, text message reminding them to put on sunscreen. The thing that I didn't devised, but my team did, was to include a weather report with that morning message. And again, at the time, this was pre-weather app. So there was some value in getting the daily weather report in the context of a sunscreen recommendation. And don't you know that that top line on the graph, those are the people who got the daily message, and the bottom line is the control group. And you can see the dramatic difference between those two simply by getting this daily message. Uh, of course, as a, as a dermatologist, I was pretty uh, forlorn about the control group having such a low use of sunscreen, but we'll save that for a different day. My point here is that when we went back and asked the patients or the study enrollees, when we asked them what was so compelling about this daily text message, their response was, well, I didn't think much about sunscreen, but I really like getting the weather report. And that's make it about life, that's subliminal messaging. Get your health message into something that matters more to that individual and you'll have better luck. So that's my whirlwind tour of how challenging it is to do behavior change and uh, a few examples of some of the things we've done. Remember now the uh, keys to engagement uh, listed here. And in summary, Successful health communications is an uphill climb. Anyone who tells you that it's simple and you can do it at a population level, I actually don't believe them. I think it's much more complex than that. We're all individuals and we all want to be treated individually. The, uh, I think medical approach is, is really outmoded uh, and, and really much more suited to an acute care framework and the three strategies and three tactics framework shows some promise, although we, we admit we still have a long way to go. These are my contact information. Uh, I'm pretty on the internet, so if people want to contact me, please feel free to engage me around this. Maybe there's a strategy or a tactic uh, that I forgot. And with that, I think it's my job now to turn it over to Ligia. Thank you, Hi, Joe. thank you, Joe. You're welcome. This is such an honor to be joining the Society for Participatory Medicine, which I've been a, an enthusiastic member of for many a year, and also to co-present with Joe and Donna, whom I've both learned from, learned a great deal from over much time. So as I was thinking about this topic, I kept thinking about a journey, and I'm a fan of The Wizard of Oz, so I decided to make this my overarching theme for this brief presentation because in part it's a fun movie, but it's also very rich in metaphors that I think really apply well to this circumstance. So um, when we think of digital health and its promise, it's almost like Oz. I heard a couple of weeks ago, investor John Doerr speaking of the digital tsunami that we're unleashing in healthcare and how it's gonna transform everything. And that's one example of the kind of positive hype that we hear, which is exciting, but for those of us who've been in this area or watching it for a long time, it can get frustrating sometimes. And we're thinking, is there anyone behind the curtain? Is this all hype or is it all a lie? And you know, folks who've given rise to that concern include the AMA CEO who said relatively recently, from ineffective electronic health records to an explosion of direct-to-consumer digital health products to apps of mixed quality, it's the digital snake oil of the early 21st century. 
So lots of different opinions on hype versus reality and whether digital health is all that. My feeling about it is that in some ways, I mean, it, it's certainly not a silver bullet. It's not the perfect fix for all that ails healthcare, but it holds real potential. We just need to remember that we're really early in the journey. So I would kind of frame it a little bit differently and to think about um, the fact that what we're trying to do, as Joe said, in part is to, to change health behavior, which isn't easy. That certainly takes a long time. But we're also changing the healthcare system and a whole culture that's very well entrenched. And I like to keep in mind words attributed, I've seen them attributed to both Peter Drucker and Bill Gates. I don't know which, but they're both right, um, which are essentially we greatly overestimate what we can do in one year but we greatly underestimate what is possible for us in five to 10 years. And I think that's very true in the context of digital health. So what I wanna do with my remarks here today is to talk, show you some areas that give us evidence of big change that's underway, then show some areas where we've seen less change and perhaps it looks like the reality shows no signs of living up to the hype or where we just don't see anything happening yet. A couple of examples of um, good things that are working and then kind of what to do about it is the final wrap up. So in terms of big change that's underway, let's step back and look at the really big picture. And a lot of this doesn't have to do with uh, health and health data specifically, it's more about data and information and the explosion we've seen over the last few years. You guys I'm sure have, have heard that more data is gonna be created in 2018 than in the previous 5,000 years or other versions of that. The point is that the volume of information available is really exploding. That's in part due to Moore's law, that the uh, number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit doubles every year. And um, so memory is going up, capacity is going up, and at the same time, cost is going down. That's pretty awesome. At the same time, access to information is going up. This is from Pew, it's a graph showing over the last 16 years. So again, remember that longer time frame concept, um, you know, about 17 years ago, no one really had broadband at home or used social media or owned a smartphone or owned a tablet even just a few years ago. But uh, internet was still very, very new. And now um, we have more than half of the population engaged in all those things, particularly owning a smartphone has really flipped over the spin point, 77% of folks own this. And this is data as of last year, so it's probably higher right now. Zooming down to healthcare in particular, um, if you look at the changes we've seen just in the last few years in terms of patient access to health records, this is really amazing. This is data from ONC where I used to work. And you can see the difference from 2012 in orange there to blue, which is 2015. This is the latest data that I was able to get from ONC. But if you look, this, look, this is different ways that patients have the capacity now to access their health data. And just look at the graph on the left, which is about viewing health data. For example, logging onto your doctor's website and seeing your information via a portal. Um, again, back in 2012, only about 24% of patients had that capacity. Now the majority do. This is through hospitals specifically. So this is not through every kind of healthcare provider. And this also measures the capacity to do it, which is different from how many people are actually doing it, which we can get to later. Nevertheless, this is a pretty amazing tidal wave of change. Um, investors are sitting up and taking notice. You can see the growth in uh, venture capital investments over the last, about the same period from 2011 to now. It's um, you know, increased more than about five fold, uh, up to about six billion. And the number of deals is increasing, the size of deals is increasing. In addition, existing companies such as the Fortune 500 are increasingly moving into healthcare. And I think that's not just because there's a lot of money in healthcare, but because of the technology and access by consumers to health data. People are seeing the um, options now. So you have companies like security companies like Honeywell that used to have nothing to do with healthcare that are now creating smart homes that have healthcare elements or car companies like BMW that are building sensors into steering wheels so that they can check people's heart rate as they're driving. So all of those amazing things are going on. At the same time, it can seem like there's not a lot to see yet. It's as if it's hidden under a house. All right, I'm playing a lot with the metaphor here, but you get the idea. So 
this graph here um, does show some dramatic adoption change on particular digital health uh, technologies. But what I really wanted to focus on is the fact that with telemedicine and wearables and mobile tracking, those first three categories of digital health type tools, we're still at relatively low proportions of the population who've ever tried this kind of stuff. So even though the, the rate at which adoption is going up uh, is, is pretty impressive, still we haven't hit that tipping point yet. So it can feel like digital health is all hype. At the same time, most of the apps and tools out there, and this is looking at mHealth apps in particular, are about wellness. That big category on the lower right, the blue, the red, and the lighter blue, that's all about fitness, diet, nutrition. Not that that isn't important, but people feel like that isn't necessarily cutting at the core of healthcare or perhaps relevant yet. And only about 10% of apps have the capacity to link to a wearable or device. So again, early days, these are the sensors and devices they link to. I wanna draw your attention to this. So this is, you know, how we were looking at that data of people having access to their health data from hospitals and other sources of um, traditional health system data, such as providers' offices. So this is what's exciting. Yes, up at, this is a, a, a chart from ONC that shows what happens with the people who actually have access to their data, who are roughly about under 30%, still about 20 to 30% of the whole population has actually accessed their data either via a healthcare provider or a health plan. What did they do when they accessed that data? Most of them viewed test results. That's the first line up there. Way down at the bottom is transmitting that to a service or an app. But that, in my opinion, is where a lot of the magic is gonna happen. A lot of that hype that we want to happen will happen when patients are more able to share their data by transmitting it to another healthcare provider, which only 10% did, transmit to a caregiver, which only 4% did, or transmit to a service or app, which only 3% did. And again, this is of that small proportion that have even access to their data. So again, context-wise, we are way in the early days. Two examples of apps and tools and, and health system partners that are leading the way um, to sort of show some bright spots. Uh, Oshner and Apple have a nice, partnership, um, crossing over traditional industry types of collaboration. Starting back in 2014, Oshner started working with HealthKit and giving um, Apple Watches or using Apple Watches with patients who had uncontrolled blood pressure. Two out of three had their blood pressure under control within 90 days of enrolling in the program. So that's pretty impressive. Another example, um, and this kind of ties back to what Joe was saying about just-in-time information and something being relevant to patients' lives. There's been a lot of challenge, um, in, at least through meaningful use policy, perceived challenge in getting patients to, uh, to pick up their test results or to access their information online. A company in health called Healthvana has been particularly, I think, savvy and thoughtful about how they make that happen. The image that you see is a screenshot from Tinder, the dating app. And Healthvana gives test results primarily around uh, sexually transmitted diseases such as HIV and other STDs. What they've done is create a basically kind of a badge that a user can put on their Tinder profile that shows that as, a, as of a particular date, they were tested for a particular condition and they're either negative or positive. They're putting that up there on a dating app because it is relevant to a real life situation. They wanna get a date and they wanna show um, what their status is in real life. And amazingly, or I think impressingly, there's been uh, about 85% of patients log on to Healthvana and take action, whether or not they're using it through Tinder. So clearly they're doing something right on the engagement side. Another bright spot of just general, like what I see as the future are companies or co-ops such as Savvy Co-op, Lego Health is another one that are actually bringing patients every day as consultants into the design process and enabling them to be um, hired by companies that are designing apps and tools. And I think that that hopefully is a, a model that will replicate and continue to grow. So those are bright spots, as you know, uh, just from living in this country and no doubt trying to access your own health information, the typical experience is often much more frustrating. It's hard to get your data. When you do have apps and wearables, they don't always work or they don't work with your life. A lot of the challenges in getting health data have been documented on sites such as getmyhealthdata.org um, and other places. But uh, let us not despair. What should we do next? 
Well, the first thing I would say is be patient and go along with it. There were a whole lot of great things that Dr. Kredar said, so I'm, and I saw his slides ahead of time, so I don't need to reiterate them. Make it about life, make it personal, create social connections, all of that is true. I would add to that, learn from other industries. Um, this is a picture of Mint.com, helps you manage your financial information in one place. Wouldn't it be nice to do that in healthcare, as an example? Well, there are many other learning set examples. And additionally, trust and empower consumers. Of course, consumers are diverse. Not everybody has the same needs um, from a health perspective or from a personality and life scope perspective. Um, so we need to really engage consumers in the design of everything because they're the ones, or we're the ones, realistically, who are managing their health every day. This is the design made by a woman named Sarah who has Parkinson's, and that little red dot there shows proportionately the amount of time that she spends working with a neurologist relative to the amount of time that she spends in a year caring for herself. So it's patients who really are in the driver's seat in a lot of their health and healthcare. So um, back to the Wizard of Oz here, some words from Glinda the Good Witch. You, consumers, had the power all along, my dear. You just had to learn it for yourself. I think digital health is enabling patients and increasingly will to uh, do, what they, do what they need to do and what they do best to um, make health and healthcare work better for them. Final thoughts, again, a reminder that most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. So stay the course, friends, we'll get there. And I am going to, with that, pass it over to Donna. Hello, thank you, Lygia, thank you, Joe, for setting me up so well, and thank you to uh, Sarah and Janice, Vera, and, and uh, all the Society for Participatory Mem uh, Members, Society, Society for Participatory Medicine, members, and hopefully there's some prospective members on this webinar uh, as well. Um, knowing that uh, I was going to be following in the uh, brilliant and expert footsteps of Joe and Lygia, who have given a fantastic 30,000 foot view of the landscape, and then um, certainly some examples from the physician side. I thought I would just take a few moments here today and really talk about how um, a patient, and I'll use myself as an example, might um, put all of this together in their, in their own lives. Um, and so I certainly have the, um, the, the provisos, as many people have pointed to me, well, Sonny, you're not a real patient. And what they mean, is that I have the um, advantage of being able to do healthcare full time, uh, personally and professionally, um, to be able to travel to events like uh, Connected Health and Health 2.0, um, to see a lot of innovation uh, firsthand, um, and have access to experts and thought leaders and uh, in, in innovation centers and hospitals around the country to draw in that. But somehow, that has not actually made it very much easier to uh, manage my own health. And so um, I'm going to take you on, uh, if not a journey down the yellow road, a little journey through the things that I consider um, as a patient managing inflammatory bowel disease, um, liver transplant, um, most recently some, some back pain and some orthopedic issues and, and, and a few other things. Um, and what I actually use out of this, you know, e exciting ecosystem um, that, uh, that does exist today. So what I think about um, and what I have been talking about for, for several of the years is that really for patients and certainly for me, um, what people who develop apps or different health uh, tools really need to think about is the relevance. So as Joe said, you know, is there something of value added, whether it's a weather report um, or in the information itself that makes it relevant to someone's life? Certainly the any app I might consider for inflammatory bowel disease is, is not relevant to the great uh, to the great majority of people, um, thankfully, thankfully so. Um, so what information um, is, is relevant and how can it be uh, 
interacted with um, in the most convenient way possible. I really feel these days that um, if, I, if it's not on my smartphone, then it must mean I'm not supposed to do it. Um, to actually go to, a, uh, to, my, to my computer, even though it's a laptop, to go to my computer to sign into a portal, uh, two-person authentication, you know, or is, me, is a recipe for me not to do it. So uh, is it as convenient for me as possible? And then uh, finally, connectivity. Um, that also, in, in some ways, is, is, uh, is the convenience as well. So I lean towards apps that are connected with the other wearables um, that I use, the other databases that are populated, who can draw from my EHR um, and get lab results. And so the more connected any particular platform is, the more useful it is for me, and the more times that I will go back. And so these are really the three principles of what I think drive patient use for, for digital tools that I want people to keep in mind when I sort of walk through what I actually um, do. And so, you know, the impact of these tools on patient care, you know, it, it was so interesting to hear, um, you know, Joe uh, have you talk about the, the theme of behavior change, because I agree that is key, but the behavior I'm trying to change is usually that of my physician. Um, I'm fully bought into this process, but I need them to come along this journey with me um, to be persuaded of the same uh, facts that I'm seeing play out in terms of my symptoms um, and daily life, and to, you know, guide them to the same conclusions that I'm reaching in terms of what I need for care. Um, and to talk about it with all of the other ologists that uh, com are comprised of my health team, even if I'm the only one who thinks of them as a team. So there are three things that I think are, are really important um, for me. And again, as somebody who has multiple uh, chronic diseases ongoing with, um, with symptoms that have uh, a real impact on how I am able to live um, you know, my, my daily life. And also someone who um, travels frequently, um, and so I'm in different time zones um, and, and the rest. So these are just a couple of things that I, that I use to try to um, distill uh, the wonderful things that my previous speakers have, have touched upon uh, in terms of an example of real life. So the three things that I'm really looking for are, one, how can I create a holistic picture of what my life is outside of the clinic? So Ligia put that, you know, fantastic penultimate slide um, of, of Sarah's of the very small time that's spent in the clinic versus the very large time, amount of time that is spent managing my care outside of that. But how can I give my doctors a view into what's happening all the rest of the time that they're not, not with me? So one of the things that I um, use is um, a virtual health coaching app. So there's two parts of that. One is the app has me go through uh, on a daily basis, and frankly, multiple times a day, and capture things like, um, you know, have I taken my medications that I've already put in there, but also things about my energy level um, and my pain level. Um, and so getting a, a little more picture of what my day looks like. For me, we have it tracked because it's customizable. We have it tracked. Um, how much water I drink because, you know, fluid in somebody with an inflammatory bowel disease is a very important thing to track. So the fact that it's customizable, so again, it can go back to making it relevant for me so that it's worth my time to, um, to go into it and enter data multiple times a day because I can then give my picture, that picture to my doctors. And several of the, the metrics that it captures are entered um, automatically. Uh, through the various wearables that I have, an Apple Watch and, and, and has a, a Misfit um, Shine, and I've certainly gone through all of them, Fitbit and, and things like that, um, and do most things through my Apple Watch at this point. Um, but that connectivity and the convenience of having most of things arrive already pre-populated is one of the main reasons why this app, um, this particular app works for me, as well as the fact that once a week, um, I have an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one through FaceTime with a health coach. So, you know, I've done it in New York, in San Francisco, home in D.C., um, in Paris. Um, wherever I am, I can have 
the health coach who helps them, you know, keep me on track, think through, you know, strategies to overcome any, any challenges or barriers to achieving the goals that we have set. But also, and I made this realization actually as I was sitting in an HIT policy meeting uh, one day that um, with having this health coach who saw all of my data in basically a real-time basis and was checked in with me through a chat feature um, almost every day, it was the first time I really had a partner, um, even though I have a great primary care doctor, but it's the first time I really felt I had a partner who understood um, the totality of my life and what it was, what it really took to, um, to, to live that life. So the second thing I really think about is, you know, developing an evidence base. And yes, it's just an N of one, but at some point, uh, and as much as I do with policy and population health, getting this one person healthy um, is the goal for the day. And uh, a lot of that can, is, can come from very simple devices. I've used my um, Widing now Nokia um, scale and blood pressure cuff to, um, and Joe, you can appreciate this one, um, uh, to help my doctors diagnose um, uh, something as, you know, obscure as a um, cortisone, cream, cortisone cream for a rash that we were using too extensively and it gave me Cushing syndrome um, uh, uh, and it's an acute case. And so, but what I was able to show them was actually the graph from my scale, from my daily weigh-in that showed, you know, in a 24-hour period, you know, I gained five pounds, which they previously, when I just explained it to them in, in my doctor in narrative form, they wanted to say, well, it's after the holidays, of course, you gained a little weight. But when I showed them the graph from the scale, they were like, oh, something's going on. So it changed the conversation. Being able to track and show trends over time um, has really uh, transformed my conversations with my physicians, um, as well as um, being able to correlate uh, different events, whether it's a change in medication, with then changes in sleep, um, or a rather metric to either show that the medication worked or didn't work and it's helped us move on and make changes to my care plan. And then the third thing I want to mention, since um, we are, are closing in and we want to have time for questions, is fostering actionable communication. Um, so I'll talk about text first before Facebook groups and online community because, frankly, text is what I use when I want to, A, talk to my doctors in a time, you know, sensitive manner and, uh, or just a time frame that makes sense to me. Um, so I've almost never used the secure messaging platform in the portal. Um, and it's also what I use when I want to get my doctors to talk to each other, particularly to talk to each other within my presence so we don't keep going back and forth across various loops. I have, um, you know, uh, texted and then done a uh, conference call um, for do we need a blood transfusion um, or an EPO injection when I was in the hospital and, and gathered the nurses around. And so instead of three hours of decision making, we called my hematologist and, uh, and we got the decision made then. So um, I lastly want to talk about uh, Facebook groups and online communities. So certainly from, oh, okay. certainly from uh, the point of view of leading the Global Liver Institute, uh, it has been something that I've seen um, give instrumental change um, and really support people in giving them actionable strategies and answering the questions that aren't answered in the doctor's office um, and empowering them both to ask questions and giving them the right questions to ask. And so um, I will, okay, I will, and on the point, if I can change the slide. There we go. Hold on. I will end on the point of sort of what's missing needed coming. So I agree with Lygia. If we could all have sort of a mint for our healthcare, that would be fantastic. Having all my information in one place and me being able to permission it to my physicians would be would be game changing. Um, a lot of what I do go into the portal to get uh, access to my test results is not for me, it's to share with my physicians. And so being able to have a record that exists across 
different clinical settings across different health systems um, would be uh, really the game changer and hopefully would en enable number two, care coordination um, and conversation with my physicians within and across these various practice settings. And I think something that's important for, for um, so many patients is being able to then bring in social determinants of health, whether it's you know, uh, challenges for education or food or housing um, or access to, uh, to gyms or healthy foods or what have you, and to be able to um, help physicians raise those issues with patients and give any members of the care team um, better resources to solve them. Um, and then finally, uh, giving clinical and financial tools about, you know, what's covered, what's on formulary um, at the point of decision so that people don't go to the pharmacy and find that they, you know, can't afford the medication that they and their doctors agreed on and have to walk away, um, which happens all, all too many times. So if I had a wish list of what I'd really want for digital health, this would be uh, the top four of my list. And I will end on that note. Well, thank you so much, all of the speakers. Um, this has been really, really informative. Uh, this is Vera Rulon speaking. And I have to say, uh, we have only a few minutes left, and we have an awful lot of questions that have come in, uh, whether online, uh, via email, uh, and so forth. So I'm going to try and quickly squeeze in a couple of questions for the presenters. Um, and then we will do our best to make sure that all of your questions are answered um, online. Uh, we'll find a method for that. Um, so I think I'm going to just quickly pose uh, a question to, uh, uh, let's see, Let, let's do an overarching question and maybe each one of you can, can weigh in on this, maybe starting with Ligia. Uh, what do you think is the biggest force that could speed change in digital health, moving it from reality to something closer to the hype? So if I had a magic wand or ruby slippers or something, um, I think I would really speed the, the uh, extent of payment reform. I think that once um, people are increasingly in the healthcare system paid for healthcare outcomes rather than volume, that will lead to greater consumer engagement through digital health as a necessity. Um, Dr. Kvidar, would you like to weigh in on that one? Well, I would I would tend to agree. I'd, I'd say reimbursement in general. Uh, so uh, being able for right now, we don't have mechanisms for providers to uh, to quantify the work they do in this space uh, at all, whether they're getting paid fee for service or as part of a value based arrangement. So we're we're working on that. There's some new codes coming in 2019, and some probably coming in 2020 as well. But uh, reimbursement, part of workflow, and yes, I think more value-based uh, contracts would be great. Donna, do you have anything to add? I would underscore the point, uh, you know, you always follow the money and create the right incentives for the behaviors that you want. But I would also I'd be remiss as an attorney if I didn't say that, you know, continuing the legal work uh, that's been done at OMC um, and, and, and that leadership to be able to um, make greater strides in the true interoperability so that the data isn't locked in silos but in, in fact follows the patient. Terrific. Thank you for all of your answers. I'm going to squeeze in one more question. And again, I apologize to everyone. We won't be able to get to everyone's questions, but we'll do our best to respond to them. Um, so uh, here's a question. Any comments on the challenges in doing and interpreting research in digital health? Hmm. Uh, I can at least start uh, just by saying that the, the biggest challenge we run into, and, and we do a fair amount of this uh, work, is the pace that that is required to do high quality clinical research um, is so slow compared to the pace of change in technology that it, it at the end of your uh, happily designed clinical trial where you have some kind of um, truth that you can speak, uh, the technology's probably changed six times. 
That makes total sense. If I can add to that, I think a challenge is that there is a lot of research that's being done out there, but it's proprietary. So you have individual companies doing their own research or perhaps health systems, but they don't necessarily have an incentive to share it. And so we can't benefit as a broader society from those learnings. And so I think it's an incredible opportunity to mention the uh, uh, PCORI funded uh, patient centered outcomes research network and the People Centered Research Foundation, which is helping to knit together those separate networks and enable the type of research um, that has been described, whether it's clinical trials or, or generation of real-world evidence through observational studies. Excellent. Well, well, thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm really saddened that we don't have time to answer all the questions, but I do want to reiterate that the Society for Participatory Medicine Conference is going to be held uh, just before the launch of the uh, Connected Health Conference, which uh, Dr. Kvitar had one of his, on his slides. So please join us. Um, there is uh, an email there um, that uh, uh, you know that you can uh, visit and learn more about it. Um, and so with that, thank you very much, and please look for the survey so you can give us some feedback on the learning exchanges, and particularly this session. And uh, once again, thank you, and thank you to all the speakers for your excellent presentation.